Hello, hey, everybody. everybody. <laughs> Hi, this is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. I am super, super excited because tonight we have a mysterious anonymous event. Well, it's not anonymous because I'm about to tell you who the author is. But we have Elizabeth Breck with us, and she's going to be in conversation with Danny O'Brien. And this, I'm really excited to hear you talk more about Anonymous because Elizabeth herself is a PI, and I bet you have many a fascinating and interesting story, but also the main character of Anonymous is a PI as well. So my brain was like, what is true life? What is not? What is yeah. I was like, my brain is so excited to hear you talk about it. And Danny has a blog, which sounds so freaking cool about like building things and getting to kind of create the life you want for yourself, which I feel like in 2020, we could all use a very healthy, awesome dose of that good spiritness. So yeah. I am going to go ahead and pass it off to Danny and Elizabeth. But before I disappear, this is the Vanna White section very briefly. If you look down below where it says, ask a question, if you have a question for our office, make sure that you post your questions there. That's the most fun of events is that you get to pry their brains with all the questions you have. And also the best way to support an author is that you can purchase their book. And I'm super excited to announce that you can get a signed and personalized, not book plate, oh nay, but actual book of Anonymous. So if you would like to purchase a signed and personalized copy, then make sure you click that link down below. I will go ahead and pass it off to you guys and I will see you at the end of the event. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All right, Elizabeth, let's get started. Why don't okay. can you tell us about yourself? Yes, so <clears throat> I am Elizabeth Brack and I'm a licensed private investigator and I'm also an author and uh, I wrote a mystery novel about it's backwards about um, a female private investigator who it's loosely based on my life um, she lives at the beach in San Diego at a little uh, place called Wind and Sea Beach and I also lived there when I was younger so that's why it's sort of the tie-in and um, anybody that's a mystery lover probably is aware of Sue Grafton. She writes the books A is for Alibi, B is for Burglar, um, about a PI named Kinsey Milhone, and she lives at the beach. And I was thinking, somebody's gonna think I copied her, but <laughs> it's actually my life. Like, I, I, that's what I did. I lived there, I was a private investigator, I still am, I did insurance fraud. That's what Kinsey did, so I'm like the real life Kinsey Milhone. And um, so, yeah, so, uh, and, and this book is, is based, you know, it's Madison Kelly is the name of the PI in the book. That's awesome. So what, do you want to tell us a, bit, a little bit about like what Anonymous is about? And I know that you want to read a little bit of a passage from your book too. Yes. And I think I might just start with reading the first page of the book yeah. because it really kind of sets up what the book is about. Okay. So, uh, and it's just one and a half pages. So here we go. Okay, chapter one. It was speared to her front door with a rusty nail she recognized as coming from the banister of the landing on which she stood. She unconsciously leaned her weight forward to avoid resting against the railing. It was a piece of white paper, eight and a half by 11, the kind you buy in reams from the office supply store for $6.99. Her hair was up in a bun from her run and the ocean breeze whispered across the roofs of the houses behind her and tickled the back of her neck as if there were someone standing there on the five foot square of wood at the top of the stairs, bleached from a hundred years in the sun and serving as the entrance to her apartment. She whipped her, head to, she whipped her head to one side and then back again, expanding her peripheral vision down the stairs to her right and toward the alley to her left. Silence, except for seagulls calling to one another overhead and the sound of waves crashing behind her. The message on the paper was meant for her. More to the point, the person clearly knew where she lived since it was nailed to her front door. It had only one line, typed with Arial 12-point font. Stop investigating me or I will hunt you down and kill you. Bitch, no police. Wow. <laughs> Between the nail and the piece of paper was a strand of long blonde hair, pierced with precision and gently waving in the breeze. The note and the hair would have been alarming enough, but the main issue, and the one that caused Madison Kelly to stand unmoving on her doorstep for several minutes, was that she had no open cases at the moment. 
she was investigating no one and nothing. Having closed her first murder case a few months before, she hadn't gone back to insurance fraud investigations. She was at a crossroads. Stop investigating me. Huh. The thing was, she wasn't. So that is the first page of the book. And that kind of sets up for you what the book is about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I know um, you've read it, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I thought I would just quickly tell people what the basis for this book is. Like yeah. where the idea came from, which was a question that we had from social media, like where I get my ideas for books. And um, this actually came from a very specific thing. I was, uh, several years ago, I was watching, it was either 2020 or 48 hours, one of those shows. And it was about the Golden State Killer, who at the time had not been caught. He has since been caught. And he's a California serial killer. And in the... Um, early uh, seven in the 70s and 80s he was raping and killing people in up in Sacramento area sort of mid California um, and then he moved over to the coast and then in Santa Barbara and then he went down to Orange County but in the 70s and 80s they didn't know it was the same person they thought it was different people and the different agencies weren't speaking to each other and it wasn't until the like 2001 with DNA technology they figured out it was the same person and he was an absolute monster. And I mean, obviously he's raping and killing people. He's a monster, but he liked to torment his victims, like rape victims. He would um, call them. I mean, sometimes decades later and, you know, say things to them. Oh, I just realized my microphone's way over there. This might help. Um, <laughs> uh, he would say things to them that, you know, it's things that he had done to them. And oh my God, I mean, he was just an absolute monster. And I'm watching this uh, show and I, my mind is going, I, I can't figure out if I hate mysteries or I love mysteries, but either way I have to solve them. So mm. my PI mind was going and I'm like making notes of the clues that they're giving. And I'm thinking, well, what did they think? Did they try this? Did they check out that? And so as soon as the show ended, I went on Twitter and I started tweeting with the hashtag, whatever hashtag they were using for that show, you know, yeah. have you tried this, has people tried, and people were responding, and I actually made acquaintances on Twitter that I still have to this day, and um, I put all my ideas up, like who it might be and, and stuff like that. So I then go to bed, and I suddenly started thinking, I, I was in a house by myself, and it's not 11 o'clock at night, and I'm thinking, what if he follows social media, and he saw my, tweets and I was close to figuring out who he was like what if he figured out who I was and he like came to my house or I don't know he's old yeah. but still. and I just it's one of those things where you freak yourself out and yeah. so I got really scared and I got up and I deleted all my tweets oh my god I'm so afraid and I I I went to bed yeah so within like a week I had thought hmm what if he had found me hmm that's a plot for a book so that's where that came from and that gives you a hint as to what's coming up in the book also about where you know how this guy might have found her yeah so yeah. yeah um yeah definitely that is uh that was one of my favorite parts about the book just a quick reminder for everybody before we continue with the questions for elizabeth that if you do have a question for elizabeth leave it in the ask a question box at the bottom okay how how did you go from being a private investigator to writing a book? Right. Okay. So that's a good question. <laughs> so I uh, was I specialized in insurance fraud, which means I did surveillance. And um, like for an example, uh, police when they're doing surveillance, they won't get out of bed unless there's four people on the team. But it's usually more like six people on a surveillance team with police, and you know actual police officers and investigators um, because it's very hard to follow someone by yourself. It's, it's, it's very easy to get seen, which would blow the whole investigation. And so in order to not get seen, there's a lot of driving crazy and um, jumping into the back seat and get a better angle with your camera and jumping into the front seat to follow them again. And it's very taxing. And I was getting older and I'm thinking, I can't do this for the rest of my life. I'm tired. <laughs> and so I thought, well, what can I do? Um, because I really, I mean, I love, I love being an investigator. So I thought, 
you know, could I do something similar? I thought, you know what, I'll go to law school because I like the logic and reason of the law and um, I'm a good student and so I'll, I'll go to law school. And I had never gotten my bachelor's degree. So I went back to school. First I went to a community college where I met you. Yes. <laughs> and um, I got a degree in French and I had lofty goals. I thought, you know, I'll, um, I'll go to, I'm going to get a full ride to law school. I'm going to get straight A's. I'll get a full ride to law school and I will um, end up like uh, maybe I can go to a law school that has a program with France, with Paris, where you study part of the time in Paris at the Sorbonne. I'll be fluent in French and you get like a dual degree, a law degree in France. I mean, this is hilarious. I was over 50 making these <laughs> law. I mean, I don't know what I was thinking, but anyway, I, I have big goals. So um, I got my degree in French. I applied to UCSD, U University of California, San Diego, uh, to get a, um, a bachelor's degree in French literature. UCSD does not have a French language major, so I had to do the literature department with a, a specialty in French, you know, uh, literature. Mm -hmm. So in between Mesa, San Diego Mesa College and UCSD, I went to France for five weeks and I lived there and I fluent in the language and I quickly realized that this American girl was not made for Paris. Okay. Um, it's not that the French are rude. People say, oh, the French are rude. It's not that. It's it's that they they have a different sort of um, culture. They're not they're not Americans that speak a different language. They they're actually a different culture. They're French, and they don't, for an example, speak to people on the street. So I would see a a little French child that was adorable, and I'd be like, oh, Tle mignon, you know, you're so cute and everything. And the mother would be like, oh, get her, get my child away from this crazy woman because they don't they don't talk to people on the street. So. Yeah. I, I was like, you know what? I don't want to go to France. And <laughs> in that case, I, I speak enough French. I don't need any more French. So I called the literature department from France, by the way. I called the literature department at UCSD and I was like, what else can I do other than French literature? Because I don't want to do this anymore. And uh, the very nice uh, counselor there was telling me the different things. And when he said writing, I was like, oh, well, that's it. I've yeah. always wanted to be a writer. Fun fact, trivia, I was going through boxes and clearing out uh, papers and stuff, and I found my grade from the SATs when I was 16. I graduated high school early, so I took the SATs when I was 16. And it said on there, uh, what's your plan major? And it was creative writing. Oh, wow. I had, I, I, like I, I had not even remembered that. So clearly this had been in the works for a long time. So I switched my major to writing. And while I was going, I still plan to go to law school, but while I was going to UCSD, I started writing about being a private investigator for my travel writing class. Mm -hmm. I could travel and take an airplane and go do surveillance in other states. And I would write about my travels. And then for my fiction class, I was starting to write about Madison Kelly. And then I started thinking, you know, maybe I could write a book and I could go to law school. And then I had some health issues that was like, I was gonna have to put off law school for a year. And then I was like, you know what? I wanna be an author, life is short. Yeah. So that's, I, I literally graduated from college in 2015 and I wrote the first book and I got my agent in 2016. Wow, that's yeah. quite the journey to get there. Yeah. Um, so speaking of your path to becoming an author, we had some questions from social media earlier. And somebody wanted to know what your writing process is like. Do, like, do you plot everything ahead of time or just start writing by the seat of your pants? And also, is it hard to write about the male characters in your books? Okay, so, and by the way, I see it says another proud graduate of UCSD Literature Department, Jenny. Hi, Jenny. I feel like oh. I should know you too. Anyway, I'll think about it. Um, so um, this is, I am extremely meticulous when I write. Uh, meticulous is the word. Mm -hmm. I, um, my first draft is actually an Excel document um, that I, it's several pages and one of the pages will be all the characters, names, what they look like, notes about them, for an example, um, you know, I had to have an address for somebody. So I put that on the Excel document. So when I write it eventually in my actual manuscript, 
I, if I ever get to like page 300 and I'm like, oh my God, what was that address? Mm -hmm. I, I can look at my Excel document. But the most important page on the Excel document is every single scene in the book I write out first. That's my first draft. I, I usually know the end. I know the beginning and I know the end, what's going to happen. Uh, I do that sort of in my head, driving around, walking around, stuff like that. When I've got that, I sit down, I put the beginning, I put the end, and then I fill in every single scene in the book, what happens. And I also put the date and time. And I'll just say that has, oh, that is the one of the most valuable things is the date and time. Because when you're writing a murder mystery, uh, dates and times are very important. Details are very important. And where the clues are are so important um, because of course I'm going to plant red herrings. I want the reader to think it's Joe. There's nobody in my book named Joe. Um, yeah. I'm making that up. You know, I want the reader to think it's Joe Blow at this place. So I'm going to plant a clue right there or I want the reader to think it's Sam Spade here. So I'm going to plant a clue there. And by doing this, I can constantly see if something's not going to work. Like if I get down two thirds through the book and I'm like, oh my God, she can't do that here because earlier she did that. So then I can go up and fix it and I haven't written 300 pages. Um, and did you, did you learn that from somewhere? Is that something you learned during your writing classes at college? That is a good question. And uh, no, I literally, I think what it came from was that I, um, when I, I, I wrote this, the first book in the series, I wrote as a short story for my honors thesis in college. And I was working full time and going to school full time. And uh, that was throughout the school that was going on. And anytime I had to write for class, we had to write two pages a week for every single writing class. And I was working full time, traveling often out of town for four days a week. So when it was time to write, I had to be meticulous. I had to sit down and write. and. So I, I think it just came from, I need to know where I'm going here. And I first was going to do a, um, a bulletin board with um, cards, index cards, and then you move the scenes around. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people do that. Uh, I think I probably saw that somewhere. I read that somewhere. And I started that. I got the bulletin board and I was like, this is not going to work because I have a lot to write. <laughs> and and yeah. I, I, you know, it's not. And so the Excel sheet is really sort of like my bulletin board with cards on it. And then when I've completed that, um, I'm looking at my other monitor because I'll have the Excel document on one monitor and I'll be typing the book on another monitor. So when I have finished the Excel document, it goes on this monitor and then I open up Microsoft Word chapter one mm -hmm. <laughs> and I write the first scene and it's, I write like a house on fire at that point because I know exactly what I'm doing and where I'm going. I have, um, I'll write like 4,000 words a day sometimes. It's just, it's up to how tired I am because yeah. I know exactly where I'm going and what I need to do. And the other thing that works for me on that is that I love lyrical writing, like pretty sentences and things like that. And um, uh, I, I mean, like I could write in that genre if if I chose, uh, but this particular genre is is commercial and it's like, read it on an airplane and just consume it and you can't put it down or read it on the beach in one sitting. And in order for that to happen, I can't have too many pretty sentences because it stops you while you're reading, you know? So, but what I'm able to do is I'm able to keep the pacing with my Excel document. I know exactly where I'm going and how fast it's going to happen. I'll even put how many pages or rather how many words each wow. scene should have. So when I get to the bottom, I know that I've got 80,000 words for my book. Um, and it's pretty accurate too. Um, and then I will uh, literally just uh, just write and write and write, put a pretty sentence in every once in a while, write and write and write <laughs> like that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so back to the original question, how, how hard is it to write the male characters since you know right. obviously we're women? So it's easy to talk about our own issues, but what about the male? Yeah. <laughs> it's not hard at all because I don't write from their viewpoint. Um, okay. I'm writing. Um, third person limited. So what that means is I'm writing, there's a narrator, mm -hmm. but the narrator only knows what Madison knows. So the narrator doesn't know what Joe Blow knows. Okay. Um, 
and I wrote it that way because she's solving a mystery and I want the reader to know what she knows and I don't want her to know everything. So, <laughs> so I, I literally um, just uh, write from her viewpoint and like the narrator knows Madison's thoughts and feelings, but the narrator doesn't know the guy's thoughts and feelings. So all I have to do is conversation, which I love writing. I, I could, I could just, I could just write dialogue from the beginning of the day until the end of the day. I love writing dialogue. And so it's not hard for me because I'm old <laughs> and I've had a lot of conversations in my life. And I'm obviously I've loved writing for a very long time and I'm an observer of human nature. And so I just, I can put myself in the position of the guy and many guys I've known these characters are, composites of actual people and I write what I know they would say. Yeah, that's my dog. He's Hi, yes, he's letting us know. Oh, you can even see him. In <laughs> you can see his tummy move as he's barking. <laughs> okay, so what books and authors are you currently reading? This is another uh, question from social media. Yes. And also, do you write mysteries as opposed to other genres? Okay, so um, what was the first part? Uh, what books and authors are you currently reading? Okay. I am currently reading an autobiography uh, from, his name is going to escape me. <laughs> uh, literally, I cannot think, he's an actor um, that was, he was in My Best Friend's Wedding, the, the English gay guy in My Best Friend's Wedding, the really hilarious one. Yeah, I know who he is, but I don't know his name. I, I don't know why I can't think of his name. I'm reading his autobiography. He's going to love that. that <laughs> I'm in the middle of his book, and I can't think of his name. Everybody else, Rupert Everett, yes. Yeah. Congratulations, Jenny. She gets a prize. Um, Rupert Everett, I'm reading his autobiography. Um, I like reading autobiographies, and since I've been writing, it's hard for me to read... Um, it's hard for me to read murder mysteries. Now, mm -hmm. that's funny, because the second part of this question is, why do you write murder mysteries as opposed to other genres? Because I have probably read a 10,000 murder mysteries. I mm -hmm. have read murder mysteries. My mother loved murder mysteries and she would read them to me. Like, like the way you read kids' children's stories, my mother would read me murder mysteries. Wow. But Agatha Christie, you know, not yeah. like gruesome ones. Mm -hmm. And we would read Sherlock Holmes together. We would read um, Agatha Christie together. Like I've been reading murder mysteries since I was like nine. Mm -hmm. And Harriet the Spy, of course, the best book ever, um, which I read a couple of years ago again, and it is just as good. I mean, it stands up. You don't have to be nine to read that book. It's great. So I love murder mysteries. That's why I write them. And I wrote a murder mystery like I would like to read, where the female PI is doing things a female PI would do. Yeah. Uh, because I've done them. So mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff in the book actually happened to me, actually. Um, and uh, someone put up the... Um, the the link to I think the the um somebody's book my book maybe Rupert Everett's book anyway um so uh I, I don't remember what I was just saying oh in, in the book things uh, that she does have actually happened to me the surveillance stories have actually happened those were true stories several of them um I have not investigated any kind of a missing person or a murder but I put myself in her position I'm like okay this has just happened to me, what would I do? And that's what I wrote. So it's what an actual female PI would do instead of where I read things and I'm like, that would never happen. You know, and it throws me out of the book. Yes. And, and then, then, yeah, oh, I was just ahead. gonna say, it's not the only book Rupert Everett. I'm like, I love Laura Lippman so much. Um, I love Thomas Perry. Um, I love Stephen King and Dean Koontz. Um, you know, I, I love, um, Agatha Christie, Sherlock Holmes. Um, well, he's not, <laughs> he's not a real person, um, you know, uh, but I love, um, and you know, I'm looking right here at my bookshelf. I love things as abstract as Bemelman's, Ludwig Bemelman's. Um, he, he wrote books in the forties and I love Rex Stout who wrote about Nero Wolf. Um, I've read, I mean, I think there's 50 or something. I've read all of them numerous oh, wow. times. Yeah. Yeah. That is crazy. The, and yes, to answer your question, Hello Darling, Are You Working was the Rupert Everett book that someone just chatted about with us. Okay, and I'm not reading that one. I'm reading something about banana peels. It says the name of the book has something to do with uh, banana peels. Um, 
so, but I wanted to you had more than one book. <laughs> I know. Um, I wanted to ask you because you have a blog called Cully Avenue, do. and it's dot com, right? Yeah, CullyAvenue.com. Yes, and what's new on the blog this week? Okay, well, so twenty twenty one is or twenty twenty rather is winding down. Thank the Lord. Oh yeah. And, <laughs> so this week or this week, I've been focusing on. Just some things that I've been struggling with, like I've kind of been in a creative slump and I, my productivity has obviously gone down this year. So I'm working toward to build those habits back up again for 2021 so we can all have a better year. So that's kind of what I have on the blog this week is just some some things that I do whenever I'm feeling uncreative or whenever I need to get out of a, a bad habit that I formed. So I have a couple of blog posts about that so that we can all set our goals for 2021 and like hopefully just forget 2020 happened. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. I can't wait. I'm going to check it out. Yeah. Um, so we have one more social media question. Um, have you ever written any short stories? Um, so I have, um, I wrote one that, Oh, I love it so much. I think I should put it on my website. What? So this, yeah, this short story is uh, the, the heroine in the short story is actually Madison. So it's sort of like a, a moment in her life, but it, she's not named in the, in the short story. And it actually, I applied to the MFA program at University of Colorado Boulder, the creative writing MFA program in 2017. And I actually got accepted, but I, life had really was just doing weird things and I couldn't end up going, but I got accepted off that short story. Meanwhile, I, send that short story to every magazine <laughs> and it gets rejected everywhere. It was enough to get me into the MFA program at University of Colorado Boulder. Um, but I, the Paris Review magazine, which is a really big deal, sent me a personalized rejection. And so, and any writers out there know that's a very big deal. So I consider that was almost like an acceptance. So <laughs> that works. Yeah. And do we, are there questions? Like it looks like there's questions. Yeah, down. we have a couple oh. questions from the, from the chat if we want to get okay. into those. Okay. So for a private investigator, what are the advantages of being female? Mm. So many. <laughs> oh my gosh. Because... So let's say I'm following someone who's uh, committing insurance fraud, let's say workers comp, they say I've been injured at work, I can't work, I, um, you know, I'm, I have to stay home all the time, give me money. And then let's say they go out and get another job. So, uh, and then their, their attorney has told them, you know, you might, you might get followed, like you, they might put a private investigator on you. And this person's very wily, so they're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna nobody's gonna follow me. So they're checking their rear view mirror a lot. Well, if they see me, they're, they're not gonna think I'm a private investigator. They're mm -hmm. gonna be like, okay, she's not a private investigator. And I don't, when I'm doing um, surveillance, I don't look like this. I, I'll have the glasses on, <laughs> but I don't have makeup on. I don't have shiny earrings on. I don't have lots of blonde hair, except for maybe, you know, 10 minutes at a time. I'll have blonde hair, you know, for, for one stretch of following the person, then I put my hair up, then I put a hat on, different things, but it's always a girl and they don't think that there's a girl following them. And the same thing is true when I'm taking statements of people who are suspected of insurance fraud, I can lull them into a sense of security and they end up uh, revealing themselves. Like they, I can catch them in a lie a lot easier because they're, I can be chatty with them like I am right now with you and they, they don't think I suspect them. And so they, you know, relax, their guard goes down and then they, they mess up. They tell me something that they didn't want to tell me. Yeah. I would, I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, I, and just from knowing you that it's easy for you to kind of coax things out of people. Too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. So another question is how much of being a PI is dangerous work and how much of it has been played up in the media and like media being you know, movies and such too. Right. So <clears throat> being a private investigator, it depends what you're doing um, mm -hmm. as to whether it's dangerous. Like there's so many, like I'm licensed in California, which it's very, we won't go into it, but it's a very, it's very difficult to get a PI license in California. Very, very difficult. And because they want to make sure there's no like Yahoo's following people around because yeah. I have a license to stalk people and they mm -hmm. want to make sure there's no freaks doing that. So I can investigate anything I want. I could investigate a murder. I could investigate, uh, you know, 
the loss of a bicycle. I could I can investigate anything. Um, so if I were investigating murders or um, you know the Russian mafia or something, that would be dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. I'm investigating workers' comp, and that's not so dangerous. Especially if I'm in my car, I can get away, you know, and I don't get seen. So it's not like someone's coming up and confronting me. Um, I mean in the many years that I've done it, I, I would say, yes, I've been in dangerous situations, but I, I don't really think it's, it's, it's necessarily dangerous. So, but like I said, it depends what the person's doing. You know, um, there are PIs who were, you know, ex law enforcement, and now they've gone into investigating murders and they're dealing with murder suspects. That's going to be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question we have is what part of this book brought you the most joy or satisfaction to write? <gasps> wow, what a good question. Right, right, right. Yeah. Let me think. Um, so I love the um, I love the banter between um, the cop and Madison and between her love interest, Dave and Madison. I love writing the banter. Oh, probably there's a scene where, I don't wanna give anything away, you know, there's a scene where Dave, the love interest, um, where he demonstrates, so her love interest is a surfer, mm -hmm. very laid back, he's a surfer, he's laid back, but he has two black belts and um, he's in the Wind and Sea Surf Club, which actually exists. And here's a little known fact, surfers are not, act, true surfers are not actually that laid back. <laughs> like they, they are, but they're, they're very strong because they paddle out mm -hmm. on, against the water. So their, their upper bodies are really strong. And like if someone cuts in on them on a wave, they will meet, they will beat the crap out of you. So, cause that's dangerous. So, um, so Dave sort of demonstrates the lack of being a laid back person. That's all I'm going to say in one part. Mm -hmm. And it was really satisfying to write that. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question without, you have to read the book. Yes. The I'm talking about. Yes. You do have to read the book because there are like, like Elizabeth mentioned, there, there are things in the, in the book that after, you know, I chatted with her and she said, no, that, that actually happened in real life. Like a couple surveillance stories are in there that are really like keep you on the edge of your seat and yeah. you have to keep flipping the page to make sure like Madison is going to get out of this alive. So <laughs> it, it really is good. Um, so the next question, obviously, so the book is anonymous and it's available now. It came out in November, but are, is there a book two for the series? So yes, there is. I have already written it. I have already sent it to my editor at the publisher. Um, and what could I say about it? Um, Dave is back. I can say that. Dave is, okay. is there. Um, Madison still lives in the same place. Um, and when I wrote, so so I will say this, we have a little bit of time. I. I you know, I mentioned that I, I wrote the first book in the series right after I graduated and it it was a short story. It was my honors thesis um, at UCSD. Well, I got my agent from that um, book that I wrote right afterwards and it was Madison and, you know, living every, all the same characters and everything. But um, we couldn't sell that book that, um, you know, 25 publishers said no. And that's like something any, you know, wannabe writers that are watching right now need to understand. <laughs> I got an agent, I got an agent in less than two months, which is unbelievable. You know, from the slush pile, I just sent out query letters and I and I got an agent. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we sent the book out to 25 publishers and they said no, and that was brutal. Um, so I had to write another first book in the series and that became anonymous and mm -hmm. When I wrote it, I was like, oh, this is so much better than the first one. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is so much better. And it sold in a week. Wow. On a which means uh, the publisher said, hey, if we meet this and this and this expectation of yours, will you stop looking at the other offers and just take ours? And I said, yes. So that was like a big deal. 
So when I went to write book two, I was like, ah, how am I going to write a book as good as anonymous? It's so good. Yeah. Like I, you know, when I've come away from it and then I look at it again, I'm not even being vain. I'm just like, I love murder mysteries. And I'm like, this is a good book. Yeah. Um, so I was like, how am I going to write a book that's as good as anonymous? I did. I did. That's so exciting. It really is. I mean, there's parts that are, might even be better. Yeah. It's so when does the next book come out? A year. Okay. Yeah, like next November. So do you know how many books will be in this series? Um, not yet. I don't know that. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. That is so exciting, you guys. The book is so good. I read it. I have it. I read an advanced copy, too, because I've got the hookup. We have <laughs> We have like 10 minutes. Is there another question? Cause yeah. there another question that we okay. had from social media this week is where do you get your story ideas from? I know that you mentioned uh -huh. before you got, you know, you were inspired by the golden state killer, but do you have other areas of inspiration that you draw inspiration from? Yeah. And I think it's from just literally life and the news. And I mentioned earlier that I either hate mysteries or I love them. I can't decide which it is, yeah. uh, but my, my, uh, my attention is drawn to mysteries. So I'll hear about something and I have in my phone a notepad where I, I write, it's called writing. That's my note. That's the notepad. It's called writing. And um, I will literally just go there and I'll write a story idea. I'll say such and such or this or that, you know? Um, and, uh, and I, it's just from life. And I'll, I'll also write down, like, if I think of a great line, I'll write it yeah. down. Or if I think of, uh, in fact, I'm just going to, I'll give something away because who knows, maybe it won't end up in a book, but I literally just wrote something down the other day and, um, oh yeah. So, um, oh, this is, so there's, there was something on the, um, nobody steal this idea. No, there was, <laughs> there was something on, uh, I saw on YouTube, there was a, an influencer, Danny, maybe you know about this named Lily Jean. Okay. I don't know. Her. Her. Okay. I'm not really big on that kind of stuff, but I just happened to see it. And she has like something like, I don't know, 500,000 followers or something like that. And someone started doing some investigation and like almost all of them are made up the followers, like she's made them up. Maybe it's a hundred thousand, but she, no, I think it's 500,000, but she made them up. She bought a lot of followers on Instagram. And then she mm -hmm. also invented them. Like she is, the, she's got all these Instagram identities and they're all following her and mentioning her. And then they mention each other, but it's all her. And oh like her God. mom is in on it. It's one of those almost like that Netflix show. <clears throat> oh my God. My dog scared me to death. Ubear wants in on the conversation. I know. Look at his. He's so cute. Ubear. Um, he's a black lab, but he sounds like a Rottweiler. And he's the sweetest <laughs> dog. But he's like, I will kill you if you <laughs> come in my house. Um, so anyway, I wrote that down. I said, either a major story or just a side character that is a fake Instagram influencer who buys all of her followers and lies like Lily Jean. So I may never use that, but I just thought it was so sort of compelling that I wrote it down. So that's where I get my ideas from. Yeah. And as someone who's very active on Instagram, that seems like a lot of work for some engagement on Instagram because I, I really do up my own account. <laughs> And but she, what, I mean, it's actually it's hilarious because she actually um, she does makeup tutorials, but they're really yeah. bad, like really <laughs> bad. Yeah, and so that's what got this person like looking at it and is like, why would she have all these followers? You know, and um, <laughs> Christine's like, why am I not surprised someone did this? Yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, but that's where I. That's literally. Uh, it's just life. You know, that kind of thing will grab my attention. So. I'm not even on Instagram a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. other than like, I like to look at pretty pictures and stuff, but I don't get into like these, like people with makeup tutorials or big Instagram influencers. I'm not following them. I was literally on YouTube looking at probably friends bloopers. And <laughs> there was just a video and it was that you know, someone said, Oh, what is Lily Jean doing? And I'm like, who's Lily Jean? And so yeah. I, but I, it was a mystery. You see? Yeah. So that caught my attention. I agree. Cause I'm going to have to Google this after we're done with this conversation, but I think that would be a really interesting character, especially like 
for the millennial or Gen Z generation that that was something that they would relate to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now you guys heard it first. Maybe this will be book three. Yes, that, that would be good. I think bed. Madison would really. I know. I mean, because, you know, and I, this isn't a spoiler because you brought this up already, but Twitter plays a role in, in yeah. Anonymous, the book. So Madison is already pretty savvy when it comes to social media in the Twitter space. Yeah. And maybe the Lily Jean character ends up dead and Madison has to investigate it. Well, maybe we yeah. should plot out the third book right now. You guys, I know you guys, we just, this, somebody asked, how do I come up with my ideas? And I just wrote the book, right? I just came up with the plot right in yeah. front of me. <laughs> I mean, honestly, we could, we could, I know. It, it sounds kind of good. So it does sound good. if that comes out as the third book, then you'll, you'll know. Then everybody heard it here first. That's right. You heard it here first. You uh, Mysterious Galaxy Bookstore got the scoop. So <laughs> if you guys have not bought Anonymous, please buy it from Mysterious Galaxy at the at their website at the link provided. I'm sure there'll be a link. Yeah, there is. Um, There's a little green button at the bottom here. Purchase but... books. Yeah. Yeah. Please buy it. And also, it's Christmas. And um, these books are going to be signed, you guys. They're going to be signed books. I'm going to go into Mysterious Galaxy and sign the book. So oh, you can okay. be giving your friends and family signed copies. Yes. I highly I recommend it, everybody. Slightly, I might be slightly biased as a bookseller, but my family gets a lot of signed books for birthdays and Christmas, and they're never disappointed. So I can attest that they do make very good gifts. There you go. <laughs> exactly. So, I was about to say, is there anything else you'd like to add, Elizabeth? I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry. Oh no, you didn't. I think I think we're good. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's no other. Nobody has any other questions. My anybody in the audience doesn't sound like it. Mm -hmm. We got them all. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna thank you guys so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thank you so much, Danny. This. This was so much fun just to get like to, to peer behind the curtain a little bit and to get to see into your world and also how that influenced Anonymous and everything. So thank you so very, very much for sharing it with us. And thank you, Christine, for being active in the comments. I just saw you comment again. So I was like, yeah, thank you. For yeah. Oh, what is Danny's blog? So it's oh. Kelly Avenue, C-U-L-L-E-Y, Avenue, spelled out, dot com. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook. I don't Holly do Twitter. Avenue. Yeah. <laughs> and make yeah. sure you check her out. Definitely, definitely. And I was about to say, too, Elizabeth, where can people find you to stay up to date on new coming books and all of your author information as well? Elizabethbreck.com is awesome. the best place because it has all my um, social media. But um, I'm Elizabeth Breck on Instagram. I'm at the blonde PI on uh on twitter but if you go to elizabethbreck.com it has my all my social media oh that is awesome and we've got the links if you look to the side we've got the blog link for danny as well as elizabeth's link oh good so there we go they're there for you guys um, thank you so so very much for joining us and we will see everyone next time and Happy holidays and almost happy new year to everyone that's it's right. almost new year. happy holidays <laughs> Have a good evening, everybody. Bye.